Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. That's Jen Schippel. And I'm Steve Jones. You are? That is Steve Jones. All right, we'll go with that. I'm going to keep going because I like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Uh, cheers, buddy. Yes. To uh, I've been practicing this for half a glass. To, to Zoom pods that we do in person. I like it. Uh, yes. Very nice. You, you look very festive there with all the roses in the background. You know, I really set the tone for the area of your backyard that I want to be presented in. And uh, I like the background here. So this is uh, this is what we're rolling with. This is a uh, very well thought out. You know, I, lo- I love the white. It matches your shirt and it matches your AirPods. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're very yeah. coordinated today there, Steve. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I set the setting. Um, t- yeah, today on the program, Jens, we have a band called The Accidentals. Uh, and I had a chance to chat with all three members of the band, Katie, Sav, and Michael. And uh, we had a really freaking fun chat. I really enjoyed it. They were a lot of fun. Uh, so we're going to bring them in for uh, in a little bit. No, pretty long chat, actually. So, um, so we'll get to that in a bit. Before we do... Uh, I want to uh, set the stage. I've been, you know, we had a chance to hang out before recording the pod. Uh, we had some salmon that you cooked, which was delicious. Uh, some veggies on the side, some toast. A good, you know, good dinner uh, leading up to recording this pod. And uh, I think I have to share some stories. But uh, but one I was holding on to was that uh, that live concerts are coming back. And I'm really excited about it. They are. They are. I'm so, I'm right there with you, dude. I'm so excited about live concerts coming back. I know you're going to launch into a story and stuff, but please, you've got to tell our listeners what we're going to have for dessert. Oh, we're definitely having s'mores bars from Papa Murphy's, which are, yes. I mean, it's like crack. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm okay with this. We talked last week about my plan to uh, remove sugar from my system, I added stuff with added sugar, all the sweet shit, right, that I am so addicted to. Uh, to we have not reached that point where I'm cutting it off yet. So this is kind of the last hurrah, because as of Friday, that's my day. I'm just, I'm starting it, and I'm really going to keep to it outside of, a few rare occasions being birthdays and that sort of thing for the next month. So oh, this is huge. This is huge. So, I mean, that, I mean, we're talking 30 days of no sugar. I mean, and to which I told, I told my friend Joe about this, right? He's like, you know, there's a lot of sugar in beer, right? And, uh, there's sugar in everything. Yeah. It's like, like how, not, how do you, how do you go without sugar? I like think you can't even eat fruit. Fruit without yeah. sugar. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm doing it in moderation. I'm just getting rid of all the crap, I think. And beer is like not the, crap, like the garbage you. junk food. Yeah, exactly. Like s'mores bars and like uh, s'mores and, bars and cookies <laughs> and uh, and brownies okay. and donuts so, uh, and, uh, and got, Oreos. I, exactly. And you keep exactly. going. You you keep talking. I'm just gonna keep listing oh, off no, the things no, no. that I'm cutting okay. out. <laughs> sounds good. So I, I I got two things to say. One, you're gonna you're hamstering it. Like you are just packing your cheeks full of sugar so that you can survive <laughs> for the next thirty days, right? Nice. After this Friday which is yeah. like a two or three days uh and the second thing i was going to say was you probably have a special occasion scheduled for every single day for the next 30 days like I there's should. a birthday every day there's a wedding or whatever you got to go to if, yeah, i should have be that prepared absolutely right like, you're like it, it, this is an exception it's okay right but but i don't want to justify it like that i mean all i will do you know i will make exception for mine and my daughter's birthday and maybe one other occasion but but besides that, I'm going hardcore. I'm going to stock the fucking fridge with things that I'm okay eating. And like, because I need stuff to snack on. I work from home and I need stuff to be able to snack on. So like carrots and uh, and I could probably do celery, although I'm not crazy about it. And, you know, and cucumber, you know, stuff like that. That's, that's healthy for me and I can get down with and apples and pears and all that. Right. I, I, I can yeah. do that. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm going with. So there we go. So uh, remind me again. How are you holding yourself accountable? Who's uh, who's who's checking your behavior, and who's got the cattle prod? Who's gonna like, bzz, 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 Steve? Bzz. I don't know. I was hoping the girlfriend would do it, but she's not. You know, not meeting me in the challenge in any way. So she's got a sweet tooth too, right? No, I I don't. Th- I'm not worried about that. I wanted her to step outside her comfort zone. I uh-huh. think she'll be okay to not have sweets, also maybe, but uh, but that's more comfortable for her she she likes sweets if it's there but 
but the goal is to not have a lot of that in the house. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I hear you. And that's, that's the hardest part for me. You know, I wouldn't have so much of a, a problem with sweets um, if it wasn't in the house, but when it's in the house, it's really, really hard to control yourself, but it's not like if the house didn't have any, I would be compelled enough to actually hop in the car and go to the store. Like that's, that would take too much effort. The, the effort reward ratio just isn't there for me. <laughs> yeah, this the s'mores bars brought themselves in, so that's good. Yeah, yeah somehow they showed up in the house. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my story about concerts being back. First off, a couple concerts that I'm kind of excited are coming. You know, that were announced this week. Um, Motion City Soundtrack is going to be coming back to the Bay Area. I mean, they kind of separated and parted ways, but they're doing a. Uh, commit this to memory tour where they're playing that album I, I imagine they'll be playing that album in its entirety as their most popular album and uh, and their their promotional materials for it are pretty funny because it's like yeah, they cro like they had a banner where they crossed out uh, 15th uh, anniversary crossed out 16th anniversary and put 17th question mark you know nice. on it like and so so I'm excited I want to go to that uh, and so Vanessa is going to be coming back around um, cool. be cool be cool to see them but in the immediate future ends memorial day weekend i'm going to my first concert back uh in the real world and it's not here in the bay area it is down in um palm springs area uh at... what yeah yeah i know it's uh no um, way you've been keeping this a secret i know right yeah and, and so... memorial day weekend is kind of around the corner i mean that's what, it's, half a it's month from now yeah just like two weeks we just got the tickets actually today uh locked it in but it is uh, joshua tree that's where it is yeah, um nice and it's with a band called conbrio who mm -hmm. um they've been on the You've program yep. yeah mul multiple times there are a lot we go to one of their of shows didn't we see them know. did you see them i don't know if you've seen them or not uh like the, I saw them at Guitar Fish Festival most recently. That was 2018. Um, and that they was, were in Napa. Uh, I thought. I thought they were in Napa. Like I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, it wasn't Bottle Rock, but I thought they were up there. If I've interviewed them with Joe at Bottle Rock back in the day, um, uh -huh. and I interviewed them at the Fillmore. So I've interviewed them three times, I believe, uh, hmm. and. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, that concert. We're going to take a road trip. We're going to stay in Palm Springs um, at this really cool place. And, you know, for me, uh, a place to stay at, the re big requirement is it has to have breakfast included because I don't, I can't start my day without breakfast. And some places there's no breakfast around and everything. You're going to be hunted down breakfast. I like it when it's breakfast included. That's like, I did, you know. Dude, you are going to have a hard time at this breakfast place, okay? This is in the middle of your no sugar thing, right? Look, this is, I, breakfast I, is going to be filled with cookies and like sugar muffins and donuts and all this shit. Uh, Dude, you're going to like explode. I could do like eggs and sausage or something like that, right? And if whatever they put in the box, like, I'll, I'll, you know, this is going to be the third exception uh, yeah. uh, for this weekend. Uh, down in Joshua Tree because it's going to be really hard to. So not... you're making an exception, like you already know that you're just going to make that one exception just for that one night. I, and you know, it's it's, well, it's a whole longest thing. <laughs> just three nights <laughs> that we're down there, but I'm going to do my best, okay? But I don't think they're going to have like a lot of. Dude, I'm know... calling you every five minutes. Put down the donut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so uh, so it'll be a lot of. Uh, a lot of fun and um, along with that uh, this is the second part of the story is that um, I'm trying to get an interview and so I email the manager uh, you know who I've worked with before over the years and like you know uh, he emails me back the next morning and it's like hey good to hear from you Steve uh, you know are you thinking of doing you know beforehand are you going to be on site for the festival and i said we're going to be on site for the festival but i haven't locked in tickets yet right and um you know and then didn't get a reply right away so 30 minutes later i was like you know i'm cool to buy tickets because i know it's been a really hard year for 
uh, for band year plus for bands and you know managers preface and every, everything like that. So you know, so no worries there. And he's then he uh, emails back last last night saying, yeah, the guest list is uh, really tight. You know, uh, I mean, we don't or he doesn't know what the the situation with the the guest list is yet, right? Mm -hmm. And and I was like, no, no worries, whatever you know, whatever works, you know. And then I go on Twitter, and uh, and I see that this manager says, uh, you know, I mean, I actually someone else, a promoter that I follow, liked his tweet. I don't even mm -hmm. follow the, this manager on Twitter, but it popped right up. You know, on mm -hmm. Twitter, this, this manager's tweet, it says, dear people asking me for a guest list spot, fuck you, buy a damn ticket. I don't care who you work for. My bands wow. haven't made any money in over a year. Wow. Um, and it, it was, that tweet was sent the same hour this manager emailed me back, by the way. So I have a hard time thinking it's not about me. Wow. And, you know, and so I'm trying to, gauge how i reply to this you know i mean because he doesn't know i've seen his tweet or anything right, right? Yeah. but but yet here we are so I, i've seen his tweet and it's it seems at least roughly directed at me um it's it's directed yeah i mean that's, you know in a, in a somewhat passive aggressive way so i was just gonna uh, say that like how more passive aggressive can you get <laughs> yeah so uh man I, you know that I, is I just, harsh I just I emailed him tonight actually and, and just said got you know got our tickets in this section you know uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, coming down Friday so we can do the interview anytime Saturday so haven't heard back yet but uh, we'll see what happens there but either way I'm going to be going to the show and mm -hmm. going to have a good good time and, uh, yeah. and hopefully do, do an interview because they put on a freaking great live show so nice. um, so looking forward to the the, the getaway trip and um i'll throw this out here although you can say no but uh we have four tickets because we got uh the options were to get either a, a four uh you, you it's in pods so you get a section of the, the lawn um you know and the closer spots are four person pods and otherwise you're in the back and you can buy a cheaper two person pod uh farther back and we wanted to be closer so we got the Four person. So if you want to join, uh, you know, you're welcome to uh, to join us Memorial Day weekend, but no pressure. I, I bet you <laughs> this is Memorial weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the weekend I'm taking off to Oregon. Mm, that's, that's all right. Okay. You're going to yeah. see the pops. You're going to see the dad. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. him in over a freaking year. You know, like so many people haven't seen their loved ones that have, that don't live in the area. Right. In such a long time it's like oh my god there's i and i didn't realize that, that was memorial day weekend um when i agreed to meet up with them in, in oregon so you know i was like god there's so many things going on that weekend yeah so uh, um when you say pod like give me a visual like what does that mean are you I, in like a like a pod like a bubble I, no, like, so some concerts do that sort of thing, I think. But the, I, from what I can see in pictures, it's literally like they tape off a section and it's like first come, first serve for in the designated section area which you paid for. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that works out. But it's like a certain amount of feet. I forget exactly what the dimensions are, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you get to your spot. Gotcha. So it's like a sectioned off area. It's not like cubicles or whatever. No, no, it's not like big balloon that you have to sit in. Nope, no, it's not sitting in any balloons. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, it's good that you're going. It sounds like it's going to be a fantastic time. Don't let this guy's passive aggressiveness bother you, and keep away from the sugar, dude. I will do my best on uh, on multiple accounts there. So it'll be a lot of fun, yeah. and of course we'll report back, and we'll bring some. <laughs> you know, audio from the concert, even if we don't have an interview. And I'm going to work on getting an interview with the opener too, who, I mean, both bands are from San Francisco, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so we'll at least have some content from, uh, uh, from the festival to bring back. So um, that's exciting news there, Jens. Um, that's super, should... super exciting. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. Let's hope it doesn't get canceled. Let's hope people aren't fucking idiots. And there's a third, fourth, fifth wave or whatever. And, oh, Fingers crossed. Yes, we need concerts.
Yes, I agree. Um, but in, in lieu of it, let's bring in a band that uh, um, I got to check out, uh, chat with. They just put out a, an EP called Time Out that was released on May 7th. Uh, this is The Accidentals. Hello hey. there. Hello. How's it going? Not bad. Katie, Sam, Michael, how are you guys doing today? Good. Okay. Alive. Well, got to jiggle. The coffee is flowing. That is important. Uh, uh, gotta have it. Do you guys like to start your day with a coffee? Is that are you all coffee drinkers? Ah, uh, we're I tea am. drinkers. Michael's the yeah, coffee nerd. I treat myself to coffee. I spread it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I tell you, I don't drink a lot of coffee. But I mean, rarely ever. Usually, it's like duck hunting season is when the the coffee is really necessary because I'm up at like three in the morning or oh, or yeah. earlier. You know, so it's it's good to have then, but. Uh, I can appreciate it. So <laughs> very cool. Uh, thank you guys for, for taking the time and being all to, uh, together. Um, I'd like to start out right now. I mean, this is an interesting time. What is this, what has this year, past year been like for you guys? Oh my like, God. Got... I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. There just, we go. I was just checking to see if we were rolling. Okay, cool. I'm ready to go. Sorry about that. I was finishing a very important email. All right, we're good. It's important. You're good. <laughs> yeah. What What has the year been like for you guys? Unlike any of the last six years where we've been on the road pretty much full time, you know, we very, very used to um, playing live shows, um, kind of recording music in between tour dates and writing in little hotel rooms on the road and um, it's been a, a pretty drastic uh, change of pace to be um, indoors. It started later. with uh, <laughs> it started with uh, we were on the road. Actually, we had just finished uh, shooting our album cover, and we were in Arkansas, and we were doing a lot of workshops for schools. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, we started getting calls that these shows, these upcoming shows, were getting canceled. And then we realized that South by Southwest was canceled. We were like, yeah. oh. This is pretty serious. So, you know, at the time we had to make a big decision. We were scheduled to go down, uh, go over to Portland to record the rest of our album Vessel with this producer named Tucker Martin, who we had worked with previously and we love him. Um, but we were worried we'd get stuck in Oregon for wh however long this was going to last. And so we decided it was probably safer just to go back home to Michigan. Uh, which is where we've been and we've changed a lot of plans since then we finished recording our album in our home studio which we built uh, we made a decision to do that which <laughs> was a big one to make and then uh yeah uh we ended up also doing a ton of co-writing over zoom with all these amazing artists which was really yeah. serendipitous and so after we started writing these songs we were like wait a second we need this shell of vessel for now put it out later in the year and these songs need to come out now because they're really timely and they're kind of expressing something everybody's going through so yeah lots of twists and turns lots of things we didn't expect uh but very serendipitous at the end of it yeah and so with with vessel i mean is that like set you have a another album ready to go yeah very close <laughs> Yeah, we're literally recording the last song this week. So, wow. Okay. So, what's your plan for for that? I mean, with I mean this this EP coming out right now. I mean, what's what is that? What does that look like uh, for you to release the uh, vessel? Well, we're hoping um, <clears throat> vessel will be able to kind of coincide with a, a series of live shows. So, as part of the reason we we tabled vessel to begin with because um, time out. Um, the EP is named after a series that we used to do on the road where um, every fall we would come off of our summer festival dates um, with the accidentals and have these big high energy shows with, you know, electric guitars and basses and violins and pillows and drums and lights and, you know, we toured with like salt lamps for a while. We had this big <laughs> stage show. So uh, every fall we would do a songwriters in the round um show where we would pare it down to just acoustic guitars and invite um fellow songwriters on stage and do like a bluebird style um you know writers in the round where we would just tell stories and really focus on the lyrics um so that's kind of why you know this ep is called Time Out. it's kind of an extension of that series and the collaboration on songwriting so we really wanted to save vessel until we could tour it so the hope is um, 
it'll come out later this year and we'll do some live show dates um, but we're also being really conscious of of safety and you know we don't want to put anyone in danger we are just keeping an eye on how things are going and fingers crossed because we are super eager to get back out there when we can yeah absolutely absolutely um and so you guys i mean you come from musical families right so how, tell me about growing up like what music did you guys uh, listen to what was on it what were your parents playing in, in your household yeah all three of us have really different backgrounds <laughs> yeah um so my parents met in nashville that's where i was born originally um and then we moved to traverse city when i was five or six but um yeah they were definitely musicians my dad plays multiple instruments my mom's a really amazing r b singer and so they met doing gigs around town and um actually they were both also touring musicians and session artists and just really really doing well in that regard but uh we moved to northern michigan and they saw that I was pretty interested in music at an early age. I picked up violin at 12. Um, and so I really wanted to be like in a family band <laughs> when I was like a little kid. And they were like, oh man, we're gonna have to get back into music again. Oh no. And so what they decided to do is like come together, form this family band and like help me kind of get in to the music scene and understand how it worked. And so, uh, so I did that for a while. And I also, you know, went to a lot of festivals Um, come on, come through. Can you, can you hear me? What if I just switch to my hotspot? Okay. Oh. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we might be a little. Uh, okay, I think we're good now. Okay. Can you hear I can us? Hear you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Look, looks like the video is catching okay. up a little bit too. You gotta love the Zoom interviews, right? So. <laughs> Usually we don't have too much problem. Like we've been, you know, doing lots of interviews, and yeah. So sorry about that. Anyway, yeah. So there's also a really cool Celtic traditional fiddler folk scene at festivals, and so I would go and like learn these fiddle tunes by ear from other artists, and then. I met Katie in our high school orchestra program, which I was a part of, and she was also playing multiple instruments and writing songs, which I hadn't really gotten into. I was mostly singing backup and playing violin and uh, kind of made those things possible for me. Once we became a band, I was like, oh, you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, Kate's story is a little different. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, I saw a lot of live music when I was growing up, but it was way more on um, the classical and the jazz and the chamber music side. So my parents um, were both musicians and my mom uh, studied voice and my dad uh, is a pianist. So um, yeah, we moved to uh, Michigan when I was a really little kid because my parents uh, both got job offers at an art school up here called Interlochen Arts Academy. So uh, my early music was walking around um, campus and hearing these um, orchestral concerts and also um, on the side like I was falling in love with um, all this music from movies I was watching um, like that movies were really my introduction to a lot of like uh, popular music and indie music and that was guitar my... hero for me <laughs> yeah. See, I was just having this conversation with someone too about how um guitar hero I feel like totally inspired like a generation of musicians <laughs> but also I what I've heard recently too is that uh, arcade games like uh, Dance Dance Revolution yes. inspired um, a lot of young electronic and DJs to start making music. So, um, yeah, very, very inspired by uh, video games and, and movies and all that. Uh, and then uh, naturally I started songwriting as an angsty uh, young teenager. So um, kind of combining all those interests together. And, you know, I, naturally I was playing cello and orchestra and that's how I met Sav and both of us really bonded over, um, you know, sort of indie pop and folk at that point. And we started covering like the White Stripes and uh, Sufjan Stevens. And the first um, time like I ever like realized who Katie Larson was, was watching her shred a queen solo in the jazz, like on jazz guitar in the jazz ensemble at my school. And I was like, who is that? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Person I've ever seen. <laughs> Did she go mm -hmm. here? <laughs> Yes, I, have, I remember, um, I 
I think we rode the same school bus because we uh, lived very close to each other growing up and we were just too introverted to like get to know each other until yeah. late high school. But we rode the same bus and Sav had like this ukulele. Cringe. And she also had a, a violin that was blue. She was like the, she really stood out in the orchestra because she was like concert master and had this bright blue violin. Um, but uh, all that to say, Michael has a, a completely different musical background as well <laughs> to bring to the table. So, you share, Michael. <laughs> yeah. So my um, my mom is kind of a classically trained choral singer, um, and she was part of a lot of different choirs over the years and got to sing at like Carnegie Hall uh, once and got to sing with like Dave Brubeck and and things like that. and. Um, and my dad is a big music lover and uh, really introduced me to a lot of music growing up. Like he had all of his vinyl from back in like the 70s and 80s and uh, would play me stuff like Depeche Mode and The Cure mm -hmm. and uh, oh my gosh, Duran Duran and like all this stuff from the 80s and uh, Phil Collins too. I think the first CD I, I bought when I was like four years old was the Tarzan soundtrack. Yeah, oh, that's great. And like as coming up as like a, a kid drummer, like that soundtrack is just <laughs> amazing because it's just like all drums all the time. But um, and so and my mom played me a lot of pop music as well. Like she loved Elton John and um you know, got got into the deep cuts of Elton John really mm -hmm. early, like, you know, Funeral for a Friend and stuff like that. Just these epic, epic. Wow. So, like, I, I, I've i come from a, like, my, my parents just had such an interesting smattering of music that they would play for me as a, as a kid. And so I think that definitely influenced a lot of the, a lot of the sounds and, and ways that I play uh, nowadays. So, yeah. You always, you always got to respect when parents will allow you to have a drum kit in the house, you know, because they're either really supportive or really crazy. Maybe, yeah. maybe both, but. <laughs> well, I was like a really little kid starting to play drums and I would like pull all of the pots and pans out of the kitchen like cupboards and i think my mom got tired of having to like clean all of the pans <laughs> off and i'd like throw them on the floor so she was like maybe we just get him a drum set and then Aww. he can just stay down in the basement <laughs> and eh, it worked <laughs> hey it works uh and uh so let's talk about uh the the new ep a little bit um I mean, we got we have wildfire and so i know that kind of came um, a little bit, at least the creation of it from um, uh, services like StreamYard, and OBS that um, that you had written a manual for. Tell me about that. Yeah, it started as a to do list of, or it started as a list of like what not to do. Honestly, um, when it comes to live streaming, like we got home and we knew we still needed to figure out how we were going to continue to make income after we lost pretty much our entire year of touring. And this is coming off of our van being totaled right before that and our trailer being stolen before that. So it was a hard couple of years. And um, once we sat down to kind of figure out how to transpose the live, uh, the live show onto a streaming platform, we ended up trying a bunch of different things out. And I was just kind of compiling a list of how to do it for my own personal record because all of them are kind of different. And then I was like, why is this list just not already available? Like all, every musician I know is trying to figure this out right now. And so it turned into like a 40 page manual on how to live stream via programs like OBS and StreamYard and Zoom and Crowdcast, a couple others. Um, so after I put that on my Facebook, it started to do the rounds. Um, my friend Jay Gilbert and my friend Sharon Corbett, they both started sharing with their inner circles who shared with their inner circles. And pretty soon um, I had features on Hypebot and Bands in Town um i had i spoke on a couple of panels for the recording academy in grammys which was surreal adam neely was on one of those and i almost peed my pants um <laughs> and uh pretty soon i had some venues reaching out to me too asking for kind of some consulting and some advice um and one of those venues is club passim which we've actually played before in cambridge massachusetts and uh they had kim ritchie um doing an upcoming live stream and they asked me if i would speak to her and give her some live streaming tips and i was like you want me to talk to the kim ritchie like who inspired my songwriting and like you know my parents who lived in nashville like talk nonstop about her like we still listen to her music today like you guys have covered one of her songs too right so, yeah, yeah yeah so this is this is just totally surreal for me i was like there's oh my god we we had seen her performing at the Ryman, sharing the stage with Brandy Carlisle, maybe three months before this too. So it was just like, oh my gosh, okay. And um, 
I got on this call and we're kind of talking. And then eventually I worked up the nerve to ask if she'd be interested in doing a, a timeout show, a live stream timeout show. And she said, yes. And I was like, okay, well, how about a co-write? And she's like, heck yes. So <laughs> we ended up just kind of uh, really organically like clicking and um, got together for this co-write and none, we didn't sleep the night before. It was nerve wracking. Yeah, it's stressful. <laughs> Co-writing is stressful enough. And like throwing in Zoom was kind of like this whole other unknown, you know, we're like, what is this going to be like? To you know, clarify, like, what if the Wi-Fi glitches out? <laughs> Co-writing with somebody you've never even met in real life is yeah. like a lot. We were, How yeah. But, but we went in kind of with no expectations. You know, at this point, we weren't planning to make an EP. We were just planning to, you know, get to know Kim and, and connect and and write because I think we had been kind of um, stuck a little bit, you know, just processing everything that was going on. I mean, there's no doubt there were a lot of dark days and we some days we just didn't feel like writing. So I think having um, this date set up with Kim, like we were really forced to put, uh, you know, pen to paper and, and come up with some ideas. So we want to, um, you know, be starting from scratch. Yeah. Yeah, and so kind of writing with and collaborating with other art artists and kind of this regard, I mean, through Zoom, I mean, like, how did you how do you go into that? Like, did you reach out to the artists and say, hey, we want to build these songs? And and also, is that something? I mean, you hadn't done done it through Zoom before, but also, I mean, had you collaborated with other artists? You know, is that a part of your process, or did you guys typically write together? Typically, uh, we tend to write alone. Uh, like, so I'll write a song and bring it for three part arrangement. Katie will write a song, and bring it for three part arrangement. And typically, whoever's singing the song wrote it. But we've also been doing a lot of interpersonal co writing ever since we started co writing with other people, weird as it sounds. Um, mm -hmm. And we moved to Nashville uh, part time right before the world shut down to try and do some session work on violin and cello and viola and also to do some co-writing. So we had already done like maybe four or five co-writes down there uh, with Beth Nielsen Chapman, who was our first, and Maya Sharp and Robin Ford, uh, Roger Cook too. So it was going really well in person. Um, and then, yeah, once everything kind of stopped, um, we came home and kind of wanted to continue that train, even though it was a big jump to do it into a virtual platform. Uh, we wanted to keep staying motivated and keep writing, especially since like, this is a time that you want to write about. I remember um, one of the last things we did in Arkansas before everything shut down was we went to the Crystal Bridges Museum and there was a whole wall of artwork made during World War II and it was very abstract and like, you know, kind of reflected the anxiety of the time. And right after that, the world shut down. I was like, man, I hope we have artwork that represents the time too in a similar way. So mm -hmm. writing really kept us motivated and uh, kept us on that track of making sure that we were processing it well. But as far as like how they came about, like Tom Paxton, we he just happened to be on our booking agency. Um, Fleming artists did this really amazing thing where um, at the beginning of the year, they decided, okay, well, the world shut down, let's do a weekly Zoom call and, you know, talk about the state of the industry and have fellow artists share their songs with fellow artists and just keep in touch. And uh, we had the opportunity to play one of our songs that's off our album Vessel. And the next day, Tom reached out via email and was like, I want to do a weekly writing session every Monday. Do you want to do this? And we were like, hell yeah, <laughs> let's do it. So, you know, that was serendipitous. And Dar, we'd run into a bunch of times on the road and yeah. we reached out to her being like, hey, you know, we've, it's about time we actually work together <laughs> and like write a song together. So uh, we were amazed that she said yes. So serendipitous, just kind of nobody's touring. So yeah, ask them and they would most likely say yes. You embraced it and you got uh, got creative and didn't allow these you know, restrictions to really slow you down, right? I mean, which is pretty admirable. That's that's awesome. And do, uh, would you typically finish a song in a session? Was that like a goal or did you have to kind of go back and, and revisit it, peel back the onion? Different people, mm -hmm. different methods, I would say. Yeah, I would say Night Train is a track um, that took a, a lot of sessions to get the lyrics right and to really nail down what we wanted to say. And we got to know Dar Williams over like all of those Zoom calls, you know, maybe spread out over a few months. Uh, whereas the final song on the EP, All Shall Be Well, the whole song was written like in under an hour. Felt like it just it just clicked immediately. So um, it, it varied a lot depending on depending on the song um, and, you know, 
who we were writing with and just the, the moment. Yeah. Um, so going back, um, your your first album, uh, Tangled Red and Blue, right? Uh, like, oh, like, that goes like that. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's dig into that a, for a bit because there's some memories there. T tell me, do, was it just like a cluster, go, you know, making that album? It, it, it kind of feels that way from what you're... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so our first gig ever was at Horizon Books in the basement in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, started out as a gig for my family band and then Katie and I were like, well, how about we make a band, you know? And then we are like, you know, my family was like, hey, so there's this gig you guys want to open for us. And we mm -hmm. were like, yes. And then Horizon Books had this policy where you couldn't really do any covers without getting permission from the artist due to like a licensing issue. And so, <laughs> so we were like, well, it has to be all original music, which we don't have. So I guess we should write an album. So like in a couple of like maybe a week and a half, we kind of wrote enough songs. I wrote yeah. my first five songs I've ever written are on the Tangle Red Blue album, which is no longer available to find. <laughs> no longer available for purchase. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it was a very like, let's go, let's get some music out there. You know, it's our first project. And um, we did it in Copemish with uh Oh. Frontier Studio. Yes, that's the name of the studio. Beautiful, beautiful big barn. And I mean, it was my first time in a studio. Like, like I didn't even, I'd never been to like a folk or a rock concert like my whole life. This was all like brand new to me. <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. We're in a studio. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you feel it came together, you know, relatively how you had envisioned going in? We didn't. We were in high school. Oh, let me just. Yeah. Let me <laughs> 15 and 16 years old uh we were a duo so we had never even met michael at this point um and you know we i think katie and i were really inspired by the same music we both mm -hmm. listened to arcade fire both listened to the white stripes and sipion stevens and saint vincent we were just like you know taking a lot of influence from these artists that we we're both listening to and really inspired by so um and we also you know the movie juno had come out not super long ago yeah. so the whole record has a very juno vibe it was a, it was a great time for kazoo and <laughs> yes yeah. and glockenspiel oh, oh, yeah. big year for kazoo <laughs> yeah. you know if i had a dollar for every time a band told me that you know 2000, you know 2012 is a well, <laughs> kazoo year I think there's accordion on that record too. Oh, there's not? definitely oh, accordion. Yeah, 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 was, yeah, yeah. We just took the I, whole yeah. garbage bin and in a way, <laughs> I think it was really oh, good yeah. that you know we didn't we didn't really go in knowing what we were doing, and so there's no rules to break because we just didn't know that that there if there were any rules. So we were like, let's put this on it, let's layer this. Like I think it was also our very first experience. Um, for me at least layering strings in the studio which has become a, like a really big part of our identity um doing session work and arranging and writing and, and highlighting those like string arrangements so i remember there's one song on tangled red and blue where like at the end of it like to have just like layered up like all these harmonies on like the violin and viola and i just remember sitting back and listening and we're like whoa this is cool like really an interest i think um and that which led to like some, some movie scoring and other types of things that we experimented session with session work yeah doing that really early on i think we scored our first movie like a year later we were still in high school at the time so we yeah. come home the learning curve the was very fast score the movie go back to school the next day <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you guys you guys are did incredible stuff like while you were in high school and still able to balance that too i know you played like 500 shows while you're rocking at school it's just like how do you find that balance Oh man, it was a very crazy time to be in a band, I would say. But, um, you know, we had a lot of help, I would say. Yeah. Like, you know, both of, all three of our parents being really musically inclined, they were never like holding us back. They were like, yeah, go for it. Like, we'll help you. And, you know, my mom actually is our tour manager and manager to this day. Um, she's kind of got the perfect background for it. She's a social worker, psychology degree, like travel agent and in the music business. So it's like everything you'd want in a manager. Um, but, you know, it's, we had that support and also the local scene in Michigan was super supportive. Like all the other Michigan musicians, there's no sense of competition there. It's all very collaborative. And so uh, lots of people like the Crane Wives and Blake Elliott and, you know, Elizabeth May Minor, May Early Wine, Seth Bernard, like all took us kind of under their wing. And, you know, we played a lot of music festivals growing up where they were all there and just became really good friends. So Yeah, and the brewery scene in Michigan too, there's so many 
places that yeah. allow for music to be played mm -hmm. too, um, which is, you know, not always available everywhere. Um, and so I think that too is definitely a big part. I don't think we toured nationally until much until Michael not, joined not the band. Not until I joined, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. We were doing some national, but like most of it was in Michigan. So I think we owe a lot of the huge amount of shows just being able to like go from school and then go to the filling station afterwards and play a set and then go home and do homework. So, you know. It's like bands that come up in the UK, they just like play yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Like, Same. See it workshop you know, for a company, you know, weekly residency at Horizon Books. Those add up pretty quick, you know. Yeah, well, you build that local presence to be able to, you know, expand out, right? I mean, how how was that first national tour for you? I don't remember. Where I, I feel like the the first really big one was South by Southwest. Is oh that what you're gonna God! Say? I was yeah. going to say the New York run, that which one? was the one that we did in September, like right after I officially joined because it was, it was either pizza? yes I it, was, it was either i go back to college or i go on tour to like new york city and the east coast no you know what let's, uh, let's talk about this because the sure, real sure. pinnacle for the band was when katie and i um, both auditioned for berkeley college music and katie got a presidential scholarship so she could have had a full ride to berkeley but at the same time we were offered a production deal in new york and this is the time that we were actually in new york oh, okay. so so this is a big pinnacle and we had like 24 hours because I also got accepted. So we had 24 hours to figure out like, are we going to go to school for music or are we just going to go into the industry and just do it? And it's not a decision you can make in 24 hours. What is that? <laughs> you're like your kid, right? And we couldn't defer it. So it was just yeah. like, you well, that, do it. that was the original plan was, oh, we're just going to take a, a gap year because all three of us are super nerdy and and very academic we love i mean just like a couple minutes ago you know we had like some video essay pulled up on and you know we love learning so i mean in a way it was, a, it was an easy decision to you know to just try music full time but in another way like it was it weighed pretty heavy on us um so we just realized 24 hours oh we can't actually defer it like you have to pick yes or no um and i'm horrible at making decisions oh, so it was extra difficult but i had already picked like what i thought she was gonna say yes to berkeley and i was already like all right so i guess you know we'll say bye to that production deal and like we'll just well because you, know. you i mean who knows like you might have ended up to in nashville or something at, yeah, at I, belmont I, like I, we have it could yeah there's different quantum universes <laughs> we needed to stay together like 40 different things but yeah no for sure so we took the production deal and went to new york and this is that was michael's first like tour that was our first like real dig into you know kind of getting into the bigger side of the industry um and yeah it, it got us in touch with sony masterworks so that's you know we signed with them did the odyssey record and then kind of got out of that and then now we're doing our own thing so it's, it's very serendipitous it just is kind of funny how that all worked out but but yeah it, it that was a that was a time <laughs> it sounds like it you made the right decision, right? So no regrets. No regrets. It's impossible to have regrets in this business. You just can't. You have to like pick it and then commit to it and just treat that path that you take with like the fullest amount of appreciation because there's no point in wasting a bunch of energy wondering if you did it wrong. You just have to make it right. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the song KW and the, the, being able to actually uh, ha play that with uh, Keller Williams on, on stage. Yeah, um, so KW stands for Keller Williams, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we had done some touring with him. Um, we were really enjoying that. Like, he's one of the funniest, sweetest guys out there in the industry. And, you know, we, we've played in his backup band a couple of times, which is just surreal. Um, and yeah, so we were really inspired by his style of guitar playing, at least I was. And like uh, when I came home from, I think our second South by Southwest, yeah, it had to be, um, I like was just, I remember like sitting in the laundry room waiting for laundry to get done. And I was just playing this riff on guitar and just really messing with it and uh, pretty much knocked out the song in like uh, maybe an hour and a half and then sent it around to everybody like hey this might be a good one to kick off the shows with keller and my mom was like you should call it kw just to really like you know <laughs> let him know that you were inspired by him like that's a great idea so then we did that and i ended up uh when we got back on the road with him it was like hey i uh, wrote the song do you want to 
hear it and maybe play on it. It's literally called KW. And he's like, heck yes, let's do it. So we performed it a bunch of times before we actually recorded it with him. And he flew in tracks while we were uh, recording it. And it was just like, oh man, he just tore it apart. It's really good. So yeah, it was a very fun song to work on and collaborate with. And yeah, he's a good guy. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. Um, so I want to go back to things, uh, something you mentioned very briefly earlier, and that is the, um, the the van. You know, the van being stolen, stolen. Your all of your equipment. You guys lost seventy thousand dollars worth of equipment, and which is, I know, was a really big blow. And you guys questioned whether you could even continue after that, right? Tell me, tell me about that experience, and really about the generosity of your fans that came from it. Yeah, well, I want to say that we lost $70,000 worth of equipment, but within like a couple of days, we uh, Kickstarter, or GoFundMe had been made and $40,000 was contributed to it from our fans, which, uh, yeah, is surreal to even say out loud to this day. So we'll start with that. That's the most <laughs> important fact is that a lot of money was raised in our behalf and we were able to get a ton of our equipment replaced as a result of that. And our gear sponsors like Shore and Takamini and Roland Boss um, yeah, and many others came yeah. through and, you know, gave us the equipment at, that we needed at a discount or for free. So yeah, we were really lucky in that regard to get back on our feet pretty quickly. But, um, but yeah, it was crazy because I had had, and I haven't told this to anybody, I had a dream the night before, the night that it happened. Um, I was in my hotel room and I had a dream that somebody broke into our hotel room and I woke up like, Oh my gosh. And I thought I heard a noise outside and I was like, Hmm, you know, I hope that that trailer is um, secure because we'd taken it off to get the van fixed. It was going through a major engine issue. And so we had put it in the parking lot of the Hilton right outside our, our room. And I was like, no, it's probably fine. I'm in soccer shorts. I'm not going to go out there. And then I was like, well, just in case, like, let me see if I can remember the trailer's license plate numbers, just, you know, just in case something happens. And I fell asleep trying to remember them. And then the next day, early in the morning, we woke up and the trailer was gone. So it was a very weird, weird premonition thing that I, I definitely like still think about that to this day. And I'm a little wigged out by, but I don't know. What yeah. was, <laughs> you, that's my I crazy mean, experience. We kind of, I feel like we really had lucked out for six for six years of touring like 200 shows a year and not having it and a big issue like that since unfortunately it's just way too common like within that year i mean we'd had like three or four friends and and or musicians that we follow who had the same thing happen like break into their van uh trailer stolen gear stolen um so i mean i feel like it was a kind of this perfect storm that had coincided where like you know the only reason we had stopped at the hotel was because the the uh what was it the van had this issue like the whole transmission the the engine, engine was fixed. like tearing itself we up. had yeah. to replace that entire engine we had to leave <laughs> that behind and take a rental car north because yeah. we couldn't use it anymore so pretty much everything just stopped but uh i think it's a good example of just how you know we just kept going and we, we, we had what we needed night. yeah we, we we had brought a few of our instruments into the hotel room with us so we just used what we had and and went straight to um tour straight to nam which was this big gear convention that we were going to ironically so we showed up to nam and just like hey sponsors like <laughs> this is what happened we're the accidentals uh you know we're gonna keep playing music but we we need to start rebuilding so it was it was definitely um a year of rebuilding but honestly having all that support like sab mentioned from the gofundme and then we realized uh when you know our insurance policy had lapsed and we weren't going to get the money back uh from insurance uh we started a patreon as well which a lot of friends have been recommending we have a friend named megan slankard who um like pays her rent with uh support from patreon and we were like okay let's check it out and since since then and especially through uh lockdown in 2020 patreon has just become like um you know more than financial support it's just this really cool community where we get on zoom calls and have book clubs and trivia nights that michael hosts and um talk about music and and share kind of blogs and and demos that we wouldn't show to anyone else so <laughs> uh, it's it's it was a really 
tragic event in the moment, but I, we've we've been able to rebuild since then. Yeah, I'll, you know, people also, you know, beyond sending money, they also sent like baked goods and like gas cards and all this stuff. Like I even had a Star Wars blanket in my pedal board case that got stolen and I got like four Star Wars blankets to replace it all because I made an Instagram post joking about it. And it's just really, you know, we had a lot of hope for humanity after that. There was never like any like, ah, oh, dang it, we're bitter and jaded. It was like we didn't have Everybody time. Everybody sucks. No. There was no. no time for that phase of grief. We just instantly, an outpouring of love, just overshadowed anything we could have possibly felt about that part of it. So. And like just the feeling too of like, well, the worst thing happened, and like life still goes on. Yeah, you know, we'd like we still just go keep... to the Starbucks across the street and get a coffee <laughs> yeah, and start yeah, over. Just keep, just keep we're moving alive. through it. Yeah, we're all yeah. alive. We all we have all of our limbs and everything. So we're like, we keep playing, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, and it's got to make you feel really good about you know the impact your music has on your your fans as well, right? So. Mm. Yeah. No, it's uh, sure. we played. I remember that night we went, we were playing in Phoenix at the Musical Instrument Museum. We were opening for Gabriel Kahane, and we just had enough instruments to make it work around our only remaining microphone. And uh, I remember playing Crow's Feet that night, and the, one of the lines mm -hmm. in the acapella section is, sometimes I will lose all I have just to see what remains. And it was so hard to get through that line because it was so, so much truer in that moment, even though the song had been written like five years prior, it was just like, oh man. Yeah, cool. when you have lost everything, everything else is still here. The music's still here, the people are still here, the venue's still here, and you're still here. So just make it happen, you know? You still have everything you need. Um, you know, not to quote Spy Kids, but an agent's <laughs> only as good as its gadgets. So is that it's a totally off phrase. It doesn't it doesn't work, you know, in the in the music regard regard, you know, you if as long as you have the instruments in the heart, you can make it happen. The show must go on. Yeah. Uh, and, and how far after that was the uh, the van accident? Like, where some uh, someone hit your van? Like, and, uh, were you guys okay after that? Six yeah, after. that was yeah that that was in the summer. I think it was late June or early it was, July. It was early July. Because I a remember days I was I was literally we were driving back down uh, myself and Evan, our sound engineer. We were headed back to Detroit. I was actually like the next day flying out to Denver uh, because we had like just ended a big run and uh, we were like all split, you know, going separate ways and and taking some time and man it was just one of those things where you know all of a sudden something happens and you know you're just in the moment and and like we got out and assessed all the damage and everything and like our trailer had flipped so evan and i pulled all of our gear out of the trailer so they could flip it back over and like the guy was like do you want me to check your blood pressure and i'm like no i gotta get all this gear out of the well <laughs> you're so like the the instruments. Yeah. <laughs> to clarify too somebody had run a red light and smashed into the van on michael's side so the drivers actually where i sit in the van right behind the driver's seat was totally crunched in uh which mm -hmm. is terrifying and then yeah the trailer had flipped and you know a couple of i think we had relatively minor instrument damage kate's yeah, cello took amazingly. a hit um, yeah 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 well Sav and i so uh michael and evan hadn't made it too far um like michael said i think it was a sunday was like we were all like all right see you guys later scene. then like half an hour later um Sav and i get the call and we're like oh my gosh. so both both of us took our cars and drove out to to meet them and um at that point all the instruments had kind of been laid out and we just kind of did a quick overlook but yeah everything everything was there is okay. th there was one hole punched directly through Katie's guitar case that just missed the neck of the guitar by like an inch. Yeah, I yeah. was amazed. It was like our dolly, like the dolly that we used had yeah. just punched a hole through that. It just guitar went right case, through but, the case. Yeah, but it just but, missed the guitar. Yeah, the the damage to the car was like just behind the driver's seat, and you know I was just amazingly lucky to walk out of that with just yeah. like some bruises and like just a little bit of you know muscle achiness and whatnot because you know i was thinking if that car had been a couple feet you know yeah. in front like maybe i would have at least had a broken leg you know yeah. and you know maybe worse and so i you know i'm always thankful that we walked away from that with you know no serious injuries and our van black betty r.i.p you know she kept us safe till the very end and you know so she was so sick of us by the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely thankful that 
you know, we were all okay and that most of our stuff was okay. Cause I just remember thinking like, as soon as it happened, I was like, again, like we were going to lose all of our gear again, like oh, within yeah. the, like six months. But then thankfully it was not as, uh, as big of a loss as the first time. There were only a few things we had. to. Yeah, record. actually SKB cases came through after that. And they were like, Hey, <laughs> you look like you could use some cases, <laughs> accidentals. And we were like, yes, we could. Thank you, you very much. Cases. Yep. So now we have a bunch of really good cases and they're, they're basically indestructible <laughs> at this point. Your life a lot better with, with those. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you're, you guys are all okay from it. So, uh, yeah, very cool. Uh, and so I, I saw on your Instagram from last year, um, good thing that went down uh, filming, you filmed a music video where you built and destroyed an obstacle course in a day. Uh, and you got to rollerblade and do archery all while wearing a rainbow fanny pack. Tell me about this video that you guys got to do last year. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about it? This yeah, is sure. It's, um, so 2020 gave us lots of time at home. So we self-recorded and uh, we also made a bunch of music videos. Don't say what song. Okay, I won't say what song it's for. The song is unreleased, um, but uh, the concept was um, <laughs> Sav's, you know, sister was, you know, doing like an online summer camp program. Um, and one of the projects she had to do was create like an obstacle course out of things from the garage. So we were like, hey, this is, um, it's kind of fits with the theme of this song where we're always like making our own obstacles and like making life more difficult for us. It's just kind of like our theme in, in Accidentals land. So um, we set up, geez, like just tons of props, almost like a Rube Goldberg sort of machine <laughs> um, all the way around Sav's house and got the most like dorky outfits we could find. And uh, yeah, there was some an entire obstacle course. There was some continuous take footage. We had our friend Jordan Ari uh, come out with his drone. And so there was like some very continuous one shot take footage where we would just kind of pass things off. And then I'd have to like rip off my roller blades, smack on my tennis shoes and run around the house so I could meet somebody else and get my bow from. It's like, yeah, I don't want to spoil a, too that much. That was a workout. But yeah, we video. did it like 20 <laughs> times. And like everybody by the end of that was just like, let's do a different music video where we just lay on the ground. Yeah, <laughs> video jumping between like tires like in that like training way and i had to do that like 20 <laughs> times and by the end of it i was just like knees <sighs> yeah <laughs> like, about to like fall over so kate not, not look like you're sweating and yeah so. <laughs> no yeah and, you know we're obviously going for as being as ridiculous as possible <laughs> oh, in this totally. so you know we're trying not to take top. ourselves too seriously but that'll be out um hopefully later this year yeah mm. yeah song song from the new album or vessel yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and you're doing a really big puzzle right now how is that going well <laughs> the cat sat on it yesterday oh, after no. oh, no. but I, I think i think it's mostly still intact but i think toby wants to wants that puzzle gone yeah he's i think yeah. he knows that we find it like that it has value to us and and cats <laughs> always want to destroy things that have value to you so but. wow i don't think anybody summed up the nature of cats better than you just did there's been many attempts that was it but uh it's kind of like we've been we've been going back and forth uh you know if we're if we're recording or doing stuff and then we'll take a puzzle break and and go downstairs and and just kind of work on that and get our get our brains out of uh out of record land for a second because it's still like a little too cold to go run around outside yet up here and and so it's like okay we need to we need to step away for just a second it's like we said yeah. every studio has a vibe it's one of you know some have like a record store above them and like some have a coffee shop down the road and ours has a puzzle downstairs so <laughs> hey it gets you to a place you need to be right so <laughs> creativity um so as, as we wind out i want to know um you uh I'm in the Bay Area. Um, have what places have you played in the Bay Area? What memorable shows have you you done here? Um, we did the what was it? it was like the Polish American. It was like British American. Yeah. Yes. Polish American Music Hall Cafe du Nord. Yeah. Yeah, Cafe du Nord. That was the oh. one. We, and then um, when we came through with, uh, we did an opening run with a band called Moonhooch, oh, Moon which Hooch. is like you know EDM saxophone trio. 
um, and we played the Great American Music Hall, which yeah. was so gorgeous. I mean, that's, I think, still one of my favorite we, venues. That was the one we were super late to. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. had to Traffic. unload everything in the middle of the street and just, like, push in for loading. But... That was the fastest. We actually, so we have tour stories. Uh, <laughs> our friend Charlie was a videographer. He was touring with us at the time. And uh, if you go to our YouTube, he actually made these, like, minute-long tour recaps for every show on that tour, one of them being the Great American Music Hall. And you could just see us, like, getting out of the van and booking it into yeah, this thing. You're holding scary. all this equipment. It's really funny. So, yeah, the tour oh, story yeah. is clutch. They're really good. Yeah, we got stuck on the Bay Bridge. We, we just got stuck <laughs> uh, on rush hour traffic. and Didn't have enough time. The Bay Bridge will get you every time, I tell you. It's a mess. <laughs> yeah, we got to leave, like, three hours early next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, I want to thank you guys for for taking the time. Uh, I really enjoyed this chat. And your band dynamic is amazing. Like it's just a, so so positive, and you guys have a really great vibe. So uh, I love it. And I'm looking forward for you guys as well to be able to get out there and play shows and play the new songs and uh, and put out the new album. I mean, lots of great stuff coming. And uh, uh, I know you're excited to get the new music out too. So super excited. Yeah. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> oh, thank yes. you. So well, thank you, uh, Katie, Sav, and Michael. You have a, a great rest of your day, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you out here soon, okay? Yeah, yeah you thank too. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Bye. That was the interview with the Accidentals here on Concert Pipeline. And Jens, that takes us to the final segment on the program. What is it? Well, Steve, it is time to talk about what's going on in the world of music. Uh, so it's our segment on music news. <laughs> We each have a couple of stories to share with you what's going on in the music world. Uh, my first story was uh, actually found a couple of days ago, which was pretty interesting. We just had Mother's Day, right? Uh, everybody was Instagramming pictures with their moms and, you know, and how excited they were to, how, and thankful they were for their moms and all that gratitude going on, right? But, right. you know, but really, what did you do for your mom? How do you show that you love her? Well, I'll tell you, Jens, um, one person, Willow Smith, uh, you know who Willow Smith is? Willow Smith's son. Daughter. Um, <laughs> Jaden, <laughs> Jaden Smith is his son. Uh, but yeah. Um, well, Willow Smith surprised her mom, Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, with a Wicked Wisdom reunion. Okay. Uh, Wicked Wisdom. Wicked was, Wisdom reunion. Okay. Yeah. Wicked Wisdom was Jada Pinkett Smith's band that was formed in 2002. Um, it was uh, um, a metal band, um, and so there was a segment like where there she was like interviewing her mom, and then uh, brought her outside, and there was you know there were cameras. There's I mean there were it, the band was out there all set up on the stage outside their house mm -hmm. and, and everything. Uh -huh. The rest of, the rest of her band, um, and uh, and so uh, there was. Uh, I guess it was a Facebook watch series uh, that this was that this was for. And the, uh, so let me see here. The show ended with Willow revealing she'd been secretly planning for months to bring the Wicked Wisdom members to, on the show. Uh, and she, um, she said, Mom, I just love you so much. And I just want you to feel a tiny little bit of the gratitude and the love that you have given me throughout my entire life and continue to give me. I just want to say happy Mother's Day. Uh, and so... Uh, what Jay, uh, what Willow did was she performed uh, one of her mother's favorite songs, Bleed All Over Me, uh, as uh, Pinkett Smith and Willow's maternal grandmother, uh, Adrian Grammy Bannerfeld Norris, rocked out. So you could wow. hear, you, you could see Jada mouthing the lyrics and everything, you know, while her daughter's up there, like rocking out with her band, uh, uh -huh. which was, uh, which was, I mean, it was a pretty cool sight. I'll just say. That's pretty special. Uh, that's pretty special. You gotta love that. I mean, people will go to extremes, you know, for for days like this, uh, even if it's something as you know simple as Mother's Day. So, hats off to you. Yeah, I got a chance to see Wicked Wisdom at Ozfest years ago, uh, and um, I mean, Jada Pickett was. I mean, she put on a pretty good show. Uh, it mm -hmm. was. Uh, it was. It was pretty cool. She had herself like a metal band. Uh, so. Was, I think it it's awesome that people are still doing metal bands. 
and and I saw her and Will Smith backstage at the show, uh-huh. and uh, and we were we were interviewing bands at the show and that sort of thing. So I started to walk over to them, you know, uh, and because I was going to say, mm-hmm. "Hey, what's up to to Will Smith?" And right. you know, but then you know, I was cut off at the pass by like you know, like their security. Manager. Yeah, and their managers or something was like, can I help you? You know, and I was just like, uh, do you know where so and so's tour bus is? You know, sort of thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> they, were like, they said they said no. But <laughs> so I didn't get to I thought he was the man in black. I mean he can take care of himself, right? Right. He doesn't need you no so. bodyguards. You don't need no bodyguards. Yeah. Uh you know, you for <laughs> I do, I do. So you know, uh, Steve, that uh, one of my favorite bands was a big deal when I was like a kid and I was like five or whatever. So uh, I'm talking about like the best disco band of all time from Sweden, ABBA. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought you were talking about John Travolta. Go ahead. Dude, I like that guy too. He's also pretty <laughs> damn awesome in Pulp Fiction. Mm, okay. One of my favorite films. I'm just glad he didn't start singing during it. Okay. Pulp Fiction as a musical would have been very bad. That would be not the same movie, yeah. So uh, we got Bjorn from ABBA who says that there is definitely, quote unquote, definitely new music on its way this year. Um, It said it's not the case anymore that it might happen, right? It's been a couple of years where they've been saying it. it might happen, it might happen. Yeah, the whole pandemic thing, but it will happen. Um, we got that in quotes. I think it's time for fans like me to get excited about this. Um, he has confirmed that in 2021, we will see brand new music from the band. Now, get this. Uh, it'll be the first time that the Swedish group has released new music in, you want to take a guess in how many years it's been since they last had 30 30 add another decade to that 45 <laughs> 40 years like 1981 was their last Damn. album dude 19 what were you doing in 1981 were you alive no no i wasn't alive you were not <laughs> alive in 1981 so i mean holy shit that was a long time ago. Like, what motivates these guys to want to get up and do another album? I mean, money. did they run out of money? Is that it? Did they run out of money? I mean, it's an amazing yeah. royalties or something. I mean, Dancing Queen is played all the time. Um, anyway, so speaking to the Herald's son, uh, he says, there will be new music this, this year that is definite. Well, well, oh my god this article repeats itself never mind so um he added we're really 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 good friends um the four of us stand in the studio for the first time in 40 years it's crazy they can still stand they can still stand <laughs> it, it doesn't even mention wheelchairs or canes no, no. or walkers you know they're rocking it these guys okay they can still stand first time in 40 years and there's just something you know, like magical in the air because they all know what they've all been through together it's hard to describe but there's a strong strong bond um you gotta love that right you gotta love yeah. that what is that fluffy little thing and oh my god what is that that's embarrassing what is happening dude. what is happening right now <laughs> so uh, so gay would you put my dog down <laughs> oh this little furball is uh... i'm just kidding he's a good boy he's so he great. likes abba he likes abba too um so i mean back in april last month uh they gave us some more information about their upcoming tour which is the avatar tour um and they are promising that this you know everything they're going to play during the tour is very much abba wow okay yeah they're not changing their sound or style or anything i mean it's it's going to be you know the essence of of what we expect um they're back in 2017, it was announced that the band would reunite in some kind of, of maybe digital form, maybe in 2019, uh, performing as, you know, let's say the avatars. Mm, I see what you did there. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you know, and that would have been the, the big thing since they split back in 1982. 
Um, but the tour was delayed. Um, the, I mean, they don't have many years tracks. Left, so this is the I know exactly. They better, now they, they better get. They better get with it. You know exactly. I know how much. How much time do they have left? They can't take you know their their time for granted. Um, and who knows if there's going to be another shutdown and all this shit. They they need to get on it, dude. I'm yeah. excited for this. Yeah, cool. that's pretty much it. Well, my story, next story ends, is uh, about what happened, uh, something that happened at an LA punk gig. Um, po uh, police appeared to shoot less lethal rounds to break up an LA punk gig, punk gig, um, and rubber bullets were reportedly used. So the wow. LAPD off officers fired what appeared to be less lethal uh, <laughs> rounds to disperse uh, uh, revelers at an underground punk gig on May 8th. Uh, they said that up to 200 people gathered for the show held below a freeway in LA's uh, Cypress Park area. However, video footage from the event looks to show several hundreds moshing around a fire pit and listening to local bands. Uh, okay. And, yeah. Um, and so an LAPD spokesperson told the LA Times that the, for, uh, the force issued a citywide tactical alert to disperse a large crowd after receiving reports of people setting off fireworks and disrupting uh, traffic uh, near the freeway. Uh, and they found people trying to set up a stage. Um, so um, they apparently the no arrests were made and there was no reports of injuries however posts on social media claim that some attendees were left bruised by rubber bullets uh so there's some pictures that uh kind of corroborate that so um at present yens outdoor gatherings of a, a maximum of 100 people are permitted in california's los angeles county where cypress park is located um, so I'm, I'm assuming you still have to be masked for those things i mean one would assume yeah, and, uh, and this one doesn't seem like it was sanctioned, it sounds like. So So this was an unsanctioned thing where people, I don't know, using social media or whatever, decided to get together at a certain place at a certain time and have a little concert. Is that what I'm getting out of this? That's what seems to have happened. So, <laughs> Okay, so the police decided to shoot rubber bullets at them because of that? Doesn't sound like a wise idea, but they, they went with it. Steve, I've got, I've got some feedback. I'm going to write. LA County, you know, I'm going to write the president of LA County. Mm. Okay. <laughs> the whatever. And I'm going to say <laughs> instead of using rubber bullets, there's something, you know, less dangerous that you could use. And those are, you know, tennis balls. Like, like oh you and I <laughs> took a walk earlier today and I got nailed in the nose by a tennis ball. And you learned your lesson, right? Like I you won't make that lesson. mistake again. You'll keep your I'll eyes open. I'll never make that. And yeah. Like, <laughs> and there was no concert. There was no, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was just walking by a tennis court and boom, this tennis ball flies over the gate, bounces, goes right into my <laughs> snodge, right? It was pretty great. And if I had been hit by a rubber bullet, ow. But that yeah. tennis ball it, right in the nose was enough for me to like, pay more attention to obstacles flying in the air coming towards me yeah yeah I, I feel you. you got one more story for us Jens. i do i uh, ever heard of a guy named ted nugent yep i have interviewed ted nugent <laughs> you have interviewed him when was that oh god years ago 2004 maybe 2005 dang okay yeah um when you met him, did he seem like a dude who could have, quote, knocked the shit out of COVID? I mean, he, I would believe anything he said when I interviewed him. I spent half an hour on his tour bus. It was one of the most amazing half hours of my life. And, yeah. you know, he told me about how his performance was going to, like, defecate down my neck and, uh, <laughs> and, and everything. And, I mean, I, I, you know, I would not question anything he would tell me at that time. I think he's a little nutty, but he's yeah. got away with words unlike anybody I'd heard before. So yeah, that's awesome. So he has a gift for gift for language, and he has yeah. the you know attitude or whatever personality to to to, to give it a foundation. Um, okay, so this dude he claims that he knocked the shit out of COVID, and he contracted it back in April. I'm assuming this is April 2021, and not like a year ago. 
but but he says that um that he did it he he, he knocked the shit out of it and, and and he he had a special formula going let me tell you about what that is uh it was a combo of diet it was like a it was a diet combo of supplements hydro chloroquine okay this sounds like a trump recipe sounds like go ahead drugs right uh -huh. and organic vegetables so the combo of these things uh, helped him make a recovery so um i guess he didn't want to go mainstream and get the get the shots right so he says um that he beat the disease that he previously declared was a leftist scam of course by following a lifestyle endorsed by right-wing political organization uh america's frontline doctors who promoted the use of hydrochloroquine in fighting covid19 despite the malaria medication be oh that was the malaria medication yeah. that sounds familiar yeah oh god that was such a long time ago okay uh, uh you know being debunked um Holy shit. So he tells his wife, Shermaine, um, I eat in smart proportions and I eat wild game and I eat organic vegetables by the bucket bowl. Uh -huh. Yeah. I want to see him. I want a video of, of him swallowing bucket full of yeah. organic material. So I'm I'm glad that he beat it, Jens, but I just have one question because we know there's a lot of symptoms that people have with, you know, touch mm -hmm. of COVID, but do you think that one of his symptoms was catch scratch fever? <laughs> Anything's possible, man. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, good times. Yeah. Well, okay. This guy is a nut, so. We know it. We know it. Um, one more story for you, Jens, before we close us out. You know who it involves? Uh, dude, please tell me it's about our buddy Dave Grohl. It is, absolutely. Uh, so there was a, um, a concert this past week. Um, it's called Global Citizens Vax Live, the concert to reunite the world, where they're really kind of... Uh, driving home the importance of getting vaccinated and trying to get uh -huh. people on board with, with vaccines and everything. Um, and uh, there's a lot of areas in the world that are, you know, are not seeing as the low number of cases we are in the United States, like countries oh. like India suffering terribly uh, and, need, and th these countries need help more than ever. So uh, this is an effort to raise funds for the victims of the pandemic. Um, the Foo Fighters were one of the headliners they not performed on stage together in a year and a half. Um, I don't know that that's fully true because they performed. I mean, they didn't perform for an audience or anything, maybe, but mm -hmm. they performed on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And I mean, it was a private thing that the clips are put mm -hmm. in and they've, they've done that sort of thing, I think. But um, but anyway, that's what this article says. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, to make the event even more special, the band had a big surprise for the crowd. Uh, you can say they dropped the proverbial mic. Uh, so Foo Fighters frontman Dave Grohl brought ACDC's Brian Johnson uh, to join nice. them on stage for a special performance of ACDC's Back in Black. Nice. Yeah, and so Love it's it. a... Yeah, it's a, uh, a pretty exciting moment, you know, during the, the festival. Brian Johnson not doing a lot of gigs. He's had a lot of hearing problems since, right. uh, you know, that prevented him from doing this sort of thing. Right. Getting away from the loud noises and stuff, right? Yeah, but he was uh, he was able to do this. So, um, so he, he brought Brian Johnson up, and we can we can hear a clip of, uh, of Back in Black here. Oh. And there's an audience and everything. You know, it's, yeah, rocket. That sounds rocket beautiful, man. Yeah. Oh my God, it's going to be so excited about the future. Yeah. What an, what an exciting opportunity for Brian Johnson as well, right? 
right? I know. Just imagine how excited he must have been. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Jens, that's our show for today. So I think we had a good one. I think we had a good one. Yeah, yeah. We can close it out and we can dive right into the s'mores brownie right Let's after do it. Let's do it. So uh, next week on the program, we have an artist named Ethan Gold. Uh, Ethan's going to perform a couple of songs for us as well. So we have that to look forward to. Live music on the pod. Love it. Um, and for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, that's Jen Schiphol. And that is Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time. See ya.